Good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this webinar, Scaling Your Biotech to Europe and the Netherlands. We have more than 250 people who uh, have submitted their application to be on this webinar. Very happy with that. And it's really about everything you always wanted to know about clinical development and regulatory interactions, the authorization of medicines in Europe uh, and also the Netherlands. Welcome again. And the first speaker I would like to announce for you is Clemens Ross van Dorp. Clemens is the ambassador of the Action Programme for the Top Sector, Life Sciences and Health. Clemens, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Hans. Hello to you all. Uh, I'm, I'm so very happy and delighted to be able to participate in this, in this conference. Um, because being an ambassador means that I'm your ambassador and I'm, I'm very proud to be so because, you know, in the Netherlands, we cherish innovation, we cherish science, uh, we cherish, cherish our ecosystem, uh, the collaboration that we have. Um, but we have to strengthen it, to strengthen it because of, of you know, we, we have a lot of chances, but also challenges, challenges we have to face. So an action program is needed to, uh, to get these chances and to, uh, to be able to face the future in a very positive way. Uh, in spite of what we all know about COVID, it also makes us very sharp on what we have to do together. So I'm so very proud that with the Netherlands can uh, host the European Medicine Agency and uh, Imer, very proud that you're here. Um, because when we want to collaborate, it's not only a national collaboration, it is an international collaboration. And as an ambassador, I want to invite you all to participate in that collaboration and to make um, the pipeline smooth so that we can get all these innovations and what we are doing uh, to the community that needs it uh, and makes it participate. So thank you very much for me being here. I'm going to listen and I'm going to try to do my best to use everything you mentioned in the action that I'm going to undertake as an ambassador. Thank you very much, uh, Clemos, for these uh, heartwarming words about collaboration and partnerships. Uh, the next speaker, I'm very, very happy that uh, Emer Cook is, uh, is present because it's very, very busy, as we all know, right in the EMA. And uh, it's also within her first 100 days. Uh, as you all know, on the 16th of November last year, she uh, got her mandate as the executive director of the European Medicines Agency. And I can imagine that it's a very busy period right now. So very happy that you are delivering a keynote speech here. Emer has a background not only in regulatory science, also at FPR, by the way, the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industry. She also worked there, the WHO and the European Commission. So she really has a breadth of experience. And again, very happy that you are willing to deliver a talk about medicines, clinical development, Europe, and EMA. EMA. Thank you very much, Hans. Thank you very much, Clemence, and congratulations on your role as ambassador. I think it's really important that countries take the role of innovation very, very seriously, because without support for innovation, we can't do our work as medicines regulators. So it's really a pleasure for me to be here. I'm in Amsterdam. I'm in our new offices uh, that uh, were uh, hosted by the, the, the Netherlands government. And um, I want to talk to you today about how we at the European Medicines Agency help to enable clinical development and medicines authorization in Europe, not just on our own, but together with the Netherlands and all the 27 member states. So a little bit about what the European Medicines Agency does, because I saw in the list of participants, there's a very broad range of uh, organizations joining the conference today. So our job is firstly and foremost to protect human and animal health. And we, we do facilitate develop, both the development, so the clinical development and the access to medicines, but also uh, having helped to facilitate the, the development, we're responsible for the evaluation of applications for marketing authorization, and it doesn't stop there. We also monitor the safety across their, their, uh, the life cycle. And of course, we're 
uh, were responsible for providing information and communication on all um, aspects of the, uh, of the life cycle for veterinary and human me medicines. Now, what we, what we are in practice, well, um, uh, we were established in 1995 and we were established in an effort to consolidate the resources to support expert evaluation of medicinal products for Europe. And the basis behind that was it didn't make sense to have all the member states doing this separately. Uh, so so um, a centralized system was set up with two, at the time, two centralized committees, a committee for human medicines and a committee for veterinary medicines, supported by about 4,000 scientific experts from across the EU. Now, in the meantime, yesterday or uh, Tuesday was actually our 26th anniversary. The 26th of January was our 26th anniversary. And in the meantime, we have moved from two scientific committees to seven uh, scientific committees. And I think this is important for the biotech se sector because we cover orphan medicinal products. That's the comp that you see there. We cover uh, advanced therapies. That's the committee for advanced therapies. We cover, we have a dedicated committee looking at pharmacovigilance and risk assessment. So almost all aspects of clinical development of uh, uh, our uh, regulatory development are covered in our committees. Um, we are governed by a management board from the 27 member states. Uh, we have representatives from the civil society, we have representatives from the European Commission and representatives from the European Parliament. And one of the um, highlights I would like to point out here as well is that in almost all our committees, we have patient representation. So that means that we are very close to the patients. And one of the messages that I would like to give is the importance of patient-centered uh, research. So, um, some of the reasons why you might want to con uh, consider conducting clinical trials in Europe. Well, we have a very, very extensive clinical research community with excellent experience in conducting high quality uh, clinical trials. So that is at your disposal. And uh, if I think about it, from a, the point of view of the member state. In Netherlands, we have a very, very strong clinical research community, but also a very strong regulator who can help with the, um, with the regulatory aspect and the advice on uh, first-in-man tri trials, for example. We have an evolving regulatory environment. We're constantly improving on the regulatory side. Um, a lot of our, our efforts are going into COVID at the moment, but we've got a new uh, regulation on clinical trials that, were, that will come into effect on the 1st of January 2021, which will make it much more streamlined to conduct uh, clinical trials in Europe. And in addition to the access issues and the regulatory env environment, we're, we're, we have policies that help. And in this respect, I would refer to the policies for small and medium-sized en enterprises where there are specific in incentives for small and, and medium-sized en enterprises, mm -hmm. or for orphan drugs, whereas if you're investing in rare disease development, there are specific incentives uh, for orphan medicines. And of course, at uh, EMA, we have uh, uh, scientific advice and we have we, we pride ourselves on being able to provide uh, uh, scientific advice on innovative clinical trial design and evidence uh, generation. So if we look at the clinical research uh, community and the experience, uh, the, the uh, extensive experience in conducting high quality clinical trials, let me just pick out two bits of, uh, here. We have a very high standard of, of, uh, of good clinical practice supported by our GCP inspectors uh, working group, and we consistently apply international standards. So not only are we applying all the European standards, but we're very much uh, uh, um, underpinned by the international uh, standards development. And we work very 
closely with regulators across the world, particularly in the International Council of Harmonization, but also in the International Coalition of Medicines Regulatory Authorities. Now, I mentioned the clinical trials information system, which is part of our, our evolving uh, regulatory uh, environment. And this really is a game changer for clinical trials in Europe because it provides a single EU entry point for clinical trial applications. And then uh, in addition to the clinic, to the entry point, there is an end-to-end -end electronic application procedure. And this allows us to collaborate and coordinate across all the member states and also facilitates electronic exchange of information between the sponsors and the member states. So again, a very timely um, uh, responsiveness, increased tr transparency, enhanced patient safety, and of course, um, based on improved efficiency and digitalization. Now, I mentioned the policies and the support. Well, we have, uh, we have a, a small and medium-sized enterprise office at the EMA that you could come and talk to about what's available in Europe. Uh, we have the orphan designation process if you're working in the area of rare diseases. There are numerous op opportunities for multinational clinical trial uh, uh, funding, such as the Horizon Europe or the um, European Centre for Re Re Research and Innovation ne Network. And then when we come to the, the um, uh, tools that we have at, um, at EMA, we have a specific tool to uh, help developers uh, for priority medicines. It's called our priority medicines or prime scheme. And all this is underpinned by the work of the EMA's committees that I mentioned earlier on in the, in the uh, presentation. Um, we also have an innovation task force and we link uh, with the national innovation offices, including the national innovation offices is in, in the Netherlands, and this forms the EU innovation uh, network, which means that we're constantly trying to improve to make ourselves ready to um, uh, meet any of the challenges of new innovation. I wanted to talk a little bit about our collaboration with the FDA, uh, because I know most of you are based, or many of you are based in the US, so you're probably a lot more familiar with, you, with working uh, with the FDA than working with the European Medicines Agency. And we have virtually daily contact with the FDA in the context of a number of clusters. So these are areas in either therapeutic groups or in, um, in areas like GCP or GMP inspections. Uh, we have a procedure for parallel uh, scientific advice. Uh, we're increasingly focusing on early development strategies, and this is particularly to see how um, we encouraging companies to share their plans with both us and the FDA so that we can have, uh, we can support companies with a single uh, global development plan. Um, we do uh, our International focus started really with uh, FDA, but we have collaboration with regulatory partners across the globe, and some of our clusters also include uh, other regulatory uh, uh, partners. Now, specifically in the area of biotech, we have an advanced uh, therapy uh, cluster. We have a biotech cluster. We have a cluster on biosimilars. So almost every area of uh, every therapeutic area is covered in some way. Now, in addition to what we do to support clinical research and uh, marketing authorization, we work in the context of a number of internet interconnecting strategies. And this again helps enable the environment for evidence generation and clinical trials. So at the moment, it's a very exciting time for us. Uh, we've, we have published a regulatory science strategy uh, last year. We've just worked together with the European Medicines Authority Network to publish 
our strategy to 2025. And the Commission has published a pharmaceutical strategy which has look, looked at all the how we can improve, how we can improve going forward. So we've got a, a lot of interconnecting activities on our plate at the moment. But the good thing about that is the foundation of many of these uh, really enable us to deal with issues like digital innovation, data analytics, improved communication, international activities. Um, and, and, uh, and I'm going to mention uh, the, uh, another um, uh, piece of legislation that is on the books at the moment. And this is a proposal to extend our mandate in emergency situations. And you may think that, and this is of course based on the experience with COVID, but actually what one of the aspects in this new piece of legislation gives us additional uh, role in the area of medical devices, which really points to the interconnectivity of devices and medicines and uh, you know what we're seeing in the pipeline where it's very hard to make the borderline between devices and and, and, and innovation, and there's many combination products or many dependency products. So this gives us new competences in that area. So finally, to conclude my brief uh, introduction, this is a picture of our beautiful Amsterdam offices, which unfortunately more or less had to, um, we, we had everybody in the office in January uh, last year and in March uh, last year, we had almost everybody out of the office. So, but that being said, we've actually learned a lot about working remotely as I think everybody in the business, uh, in the business world has done. We're open for business where all our committees are operating as normal. We're there to provide scientific advice. We can, we, we, we're ready to engage in early interaction uh, with any, any developers. And of course, we're supported um, by uh, all the authorities in the EU. But in this, I, in this particular context, I want to particularly thank the Dutch authorities. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, we're open for business and we're looking forward to working with you. Thank you very much, Imer. Uh, I mean, if we would be in an audience right now, I would give a big applause. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. And by the way, uh, happy uh, birthday on the fact that your 26th anniversary for Ima was yesterday. Uh, so normally we're given some flowers in that case, not possible right now. I saw many questions coming in. Uh, may I just ask one question, Imer? I mean, you just started eh, in, in, in your new role uh, less than 100 days ago. But if we now look a few years ahead of us, what would you like to have achieved then at the end, let's say, when you give over to the next person? What, what was the most, let's say, important priority for you? Is it simplification of procedures? Uh, what, what would it be? Well, it's very, uh, you know, it's very hard to name one priority, but I, I think in the context of this, this audience, I really would like to stress uh, the opportunities of digitalization, both to improve our internal efficiency, and we're looking at a lot of this, and I think it's really, really time, but it also means we have to staff up a little bit differently, um, but also in terms of uh, embracing digital change in terms of the innovations that, that are coming in. So I would say digitalization and data in analytics are going to be very much a part of how we do business, and I would like to, to see a big change between how we're doing business today and how we're doing business when I leave in less than five years' time. Okay, thank you very much, Imer. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and our next speaker is actually on the business side, uh, the longest sitting CEO of any Dutch biopharma company, in fact, of any Dutch listed company, uh, and also the CEO of Galapagos, who at a certain moment, some time ago, was the largest uh, European biotech company. So, Oliver van der Stolpe, very happy you are on board as well. Please share with the audience some experiences about scaling your company uh, and building it. Uh, what happened? Honor. Thank you, Hans. Well, let me uh, go back actually before um, uh, I started Galapagos 22 years ago. I spent uh, the early 90s in the, in the United States for the Netherlands Foreign Investment Agency, which is the uh, part of the Economic Affairs, Ministry of Economic Affairs, who helps the companies to set up operations in Holland. And 
I actually, and I'm telling the story because the attractiveness of uh, the Netherlands is not just something of the last couple of years. When I was in that office, uh, I was responsible for the, uh, the health tech, uh, the, the biotech and, and the medical technologies. And one of the companies that uh, I got uh, very closely involved with was uh, Synergen, who was based in uh, Boulder, Colorado. And we, uh, uh, we actually helped them uh, to coordinate their efforts in the, in the Netherlands. They wanted to set up a European manufacturing plant, which would have been a, a, a thousand people um, uh, factory. Uh, they already set up the headquarters, European headquarters in The Hague. Um, and uh, so where they had, I guess, 60 people at some point in time. So I went with the Minister of Affair, Economic Affairs to that, to that site um, and uh, everything was, uh, was going smoothly. And we should have had a, a big factory of, uh, of Synergen in, uh, in the Netherlands. Was it not that um, the trial that was ongoing didn't work out? They were going for a product um, for septic shock and as many companies have failed in septic shock, they did as well. So the project never realized, but it showed um, that among the European uh, countries, the Netherlands uh, was uh, clearly for them uh, the preferred uh, country to locate. Um, one of the other countries, of course, the companies that, that settled in the, in the Netherlands is uh, Senecor, uh, which is now played a crucial role in the production of the, uh, the COVID-19 vaccine from, from J&J. So there are many good examples of uh, early adapters to, uh, to the Netherlands as their place for, for biotech activities. Um, when I started Galapagos, which is uh, 22 years back, uh, we had the choice to, uh, to basically go wherever we wanted. Um, we, had an, uh, uh, we started as, as a joint venture between a, a Dutch and a Belgium company. So we set operations uh, in, in uh, both countries in the labs of these, uh, uh, these companies. And uh, in the early years, it was extremely difficult to get access to sufficient funds to build out the company to the size that we thought was necessary to, uh, to progress our, our programs. Um, we haven't taken an easy route. We, uh, uh, we have developed a platform to identify novel targets. So really the early genomics activities um, based, uh, around a viral uh, technology, um, but it has very successfully come up with very attractive uh, new mode of action targets. Um, um, along the way, we evolved from a biology company into a, a chemistry company to a clinical company. And since last year, we actually a fully integrated biopharmaceutical company because we got our first product on the market, uh, Fulgotinib for rheumatoid arthritis, uh, that we're actually marketing ourselves in, uh, in Europe. Uh, so we do all these, um, these activities uh, from, uh, uh, mainly from the Netherlands and, uh, and Belgium. And it's interesting to see that um, even though the hurdles to be successful in Europe are clearly higher than in the US because the availability of capital is so much less here. The uh, risk appetite um, is less. The knowledge of the investors is, is clearly not at par with um, American investors, but it can be done. And uh, we are one of the examples in Europe that, um, that we actually um, climbed over the, the hurdles and were able to ultimately list the company on the NASDAQ. And uh, now I guess, 80% of our shareholders are, um, are American shareholders. Um, and, uh, and that's fine, I always regret it a little bit because the, uh, the success of, of, of a company like Galapagos is then mainly shared by, by uh, foreign investors, by US investors rather than European, but that's at their own choice, of course. Uh, pe people have to, the choice to invest in whatever they want. Um, but we were able to, uh, to build out Galapagos um, partly on our own, partly through partnerships with pharma companies. And ultimately we did an um, incredible uh, deal with, with Gilead a year and a half ago, where um, the um, Californian company invested five and a half billion dollars into Galapagos to get access to uh, our products outside Europe. And this is an interesting way to collaborate. They have an option on, on every program that we come up with after we complete phase two trials. Uh, after that, they can opt in and jointly with us develop um, the program towards the market where we keep the full unencumbered rights in, in Europe and they can um, continue developing it and marketing it outside Europe and we get a royalty um, for, for sales that they realize. It's attractive because it enables Galapagos to build a commercial infrastructure throughout all of Europe. Um, and from there on, 
um, yeah, establish ourselves as a, as a player in, in the pharmaceutical um, industry. And then after a certain amount of years, we, uh, we will take the big jump and start marketing some of our products in the US as well. Um, what one of the things that we never lacked in, uh, in, in Europe um, is talent. Uh, the talent uh, has always been available and people always ask them, ask us, would it have been easier to, uh, to set this up in, uh, uh, in the US? And uh, from a talent point of view, I don't think so because the competition is clear, is much uh, more stringent there than it is, uh, than it is here. Um, we are uh, a big fish in a relatively small pond, uh, and that um, that enables us to uh, to get the best people uh, to come to uh, to Galapagos. So, be it chemists, be it biologists, be it clinical development people, there's of course in Europe a fantastic pharmaceutical industry with um, which educates people to the level that you need as a biotech company to at some point bring a product to the market. People from regulatory backgrounds or uh, pharmacovigilance or the registration people to bring it to the EMA and the FDA. That's all available through the, uh, uh, the, the network work that is created by the, uh, the big pharma companies like J&J uh, like &J and, and AstraZeneca and um, many others. So it's, from that point of view, I've always thought uh, it's a good place to do business. Would it be easier to set up Galapagos in the US? Sure, it would have. Uh, but um, uh, I must say that there are also, if I look back, many pluses to uh, being here, um, a little bit less exposed than it would have been if you were in the US. Um, <clears throat> we got supported by uh, both the Dutch as well as the Belgium governments to, uh, to do innovative research. Uh, we've been able to uh, slowly build our company to uh, to a level, we went public in, in on the European stock exchanges in, in 2005 uh, and only to the, the NASDAQ um, three and a half years ago. So it, um, it enabled us to establish the pipeline, uh, the products, the company uh, to, um, to pass the scrutiny of the US investors. And uh, that, that actually helped us to, uh, to be ready when we actually went to the NASDAQ uh, to um, uh, get the real big investors in, the big money in, and uh, expand the company to what it is today. Uh, we're now with um, 1,300 people, so we're not a small biotech uh, anymore. Uh, we have a pipeline ranging from all uh, kind of inf inflammatory products uh, to fibrotic products. Um, and we are, um, as I said, expanding the commercial activities throughout Europe. So it's an, uh, it's an interesting... Um, uh, Boy's book, I would say, it's been a fantastic journey to bring this company from two people in the lab to, uh, to where we are today. Um, and what, what it shows that it actually can be done from a, a country like the Netherlands. And I think that's the, the best um, recommendation that I can do to uh, when you consider going to Europe, being it with a European research facility or manufacturing or regulatory office to actually have a close look at the Netherlands. Um, of course, the, and I'm sure that's going to be told, uh, discussed as well today, but the infrastructure here with, um, with Schiphol Airport, the, uh, all the logistic advantages, the language skills that the people have, um, the short distances, uh, there's a lot to be said. And uh, uh, not the least, having the EMA uh, next door, um, we are 50 minutes away from, uh, from the Amsterdam office of the EMA. So that is uh, it's big plus. So rather than going to, um, to the Brexit country, England, uh, I would uh, definitely have a first look into, uh, into the Netherlands. Oh, thank, you very much. Much. Uh, thank you very much, Arno. I uh, really appreciate that, that pitch. It was almost a pitch, in the but you have been working at the Netherlands for an investment agency in the past. <laughs> I remember some like, of the arguments. That comes back again. Yeah. Yes. But you are the living example how indeed it can be done, how you can build a huge company, a great company, which is serving patients in the end. So well done, congratulations. And you already referred to Ono to the panel we are having. We have uh, four very distinguished panel members here on screen as well. And uh, I'll start with the first one, which is uh, Bert Leufkens, a former chair of the Medicines Evaluation Board, nowadays emeritus professor, but still very much involved in partnerships. We have Hugo Hertz, the current executive director of the Dutch Medicines Evaluation Board, Ines de Greef, who's CEO 
of a young uh, biotech company, which is still scaling up and growing. And we have uh, Hugh Berniers, who is the chief medical officer of one of the largest biotech companies in the world, Amgen, uh, in the Netherlands. He's uh, the chief medical officer. So great panel. Uh, and I also would like to invite all of you who are listening, please submit questions because uh, this will be very interactive as much as we can do it. So any question you have will get priority and will be fired at one of the panel members. But after the short introduction, could I start with you, Bert, and ask you a little bit to what, what comes up in your mind when you talk about the clinical development and regulatory environment in Europe and the Netherlands? What comes up in your mind? What keeps you busy? Well, thank you, Hans, and also thank you for the opportunity to uh, to join this uh, distinguished panel. Well, I want to give follow up on what uh, what uh, Ono and also I think Ima brought that there was a there was a very very productive and also very uh, um, stimulating ecosystem where two people in the lab to find a lead and then go further, etc. And then what I would like to uh, emphasize is that there's a there's a long history of of and uh, on already mentioned it, um, um, a smart mix of, of public and, and private money uh, and enabling uh, infrastructure when it comes to dialogue, in particular dialogue also with the, with the regulators and I'm sure that Hugo and, and, and other folks will address that, but also that you have respect for your opposition because we, we know we, we have all these challenges on gene and cell therapy, agnostic uh, indications and, and, we, and all these areas who cry not only you know ticking boxes but an open mind to where where are the the, the open spots to, to to maneuver and that 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 whole ecosystem of, of public private um, not only entrepreneurship but also collaboration is is is, is at the at the heart of a, a lot of Dutch uh, platforms. Yeah, can I ask a question? Because a question just came in here. Uh, where somebody's asking in the Boston area, there's a huge seed environment, uh, capital environment, eh? so really very prosperous. Uh, how is that in the Netherlands? Because you talk about private public partnership, or not refer to, uh, let's say, government funding even. How do you see that, uh, that young companies can actually get a start with money, not necessarily from, uh, uh, yeah, from VCs, but also from others? Can you, can you say something about it? Public private partnership funding? It is, uh, I assume, Hans, you, you asked this question to me, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's, that's, um, uh, that is something that, that is, that's growing and growing. And, and, and we see also, for instance, in the past, uh, the, the Dutch government invested a lot in, in the top institute pharma, but we had the equivalent in, in, in the med tech space and the molecular space. Uh, we see a lot of collaboration also in, it was in Europe, we see IMI project. So that's growing and growing. It becomes harder to 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 have um, a, a continuity beyond the project, and it is something we're working a lot of because that re needs really innovation, particularly also when it comes to these you know these new challenges where regulatory innovation is is really important to speed up uh, the, the, the the trial efficiency, but also have that dialogue with with stakeholders and. I would really like to emphasize that that stakeholder um, is not only you know the public and the private, but it includes also patient groups, uh, the ethical people, uh, people who are really also keen on you know go beyond the innovation because it's not only the product but also the implementation of the product in the in the clinic. Uh, what is, is is important here? Uh, thanks for those comments, yeah. And Ines, uh, I think that was a very nice segue to what Barrett was saying about collaboration with patient organizations as well. Can you say a little bit more about your company, which you're building, and your view there? Uh, off mute, uh, Ines. Uh, you are still on mute. Not again. Yeah, Not anymore. <laughs> yeah. It's still online meetings, eh? <laughs> So yes, uh, I, I have a background in, in drug development for over 20 years and eight years ago, uh, two patients called me with diagnosed with ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And basically their question was, well, ALS is a, is a disease where, you, where obviously there is no treatment available and you die within three to five years. And they wanted to start a biotech company because they wanted to have more innovation in ALS. And, and they called me and asked, me whether I could help them and then I said of course I mean it's a challenge I've been working uh, 
in the past also on HIV, and I've always found it very inspiring that a patient could really have a role in drug development. And, and Treva is basically doing that as well. So when we started, we only had you know an idea that we wanted to have a biotech focusing on ALS drugs. And then I worked out a strategy uh, for developing drugs. And then eventually we, we had two drugs in development. And and it was, you know, uh, it was not that easy. So fortunately, we had also the possibility to get funding from, from the government. We got uh, a public-private partnership. We worked with the ALS Center in Utrecht. We had this, this important aspect of the, of the stakeholders, but we had also innovation credits, but uh, we also had money from grants, both from the US, I have to admit, as well, and the Netherlands, I think they are ego in amount. And I think that that really helped us developing us our drug further. So from that perspective, I think the Netherlands had a very good climate to bring everybody together and get a good understanding of where we come from. And now eight years later, you see a lot of more innovation in, in neurodegenerative diseases. And I think that that's great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And that's also where I get a nice segue to Hugo, because I get a question here, Hugo, which says that we are a specialized US-based laboratory that helps companies accelerate product development. And then how can we enhance our exposure in Europe? Would it be worth the investment to establish a lab in Europe? Now, you are with the regulator, of course. You're executive director of the Dutch Medicine Evaluation Board. And what does come to your mind when you think about the Netherlands as a potential soil for this is now a lab company, but for any company, especially with medicine development, why would they come to Holland? Can you say something more about that? Well, the, the, the first advice that I would give um, is uh, make sure that you're prepared because the landscape in the Netherlands is definitely different from what, uh, what you may have experienced so far in the United States. And at first glance, it may look very complicated because we're only a small country, but we have organize things differently. You will find out, in, uh, especially in the regulatory landscape, that uh, different responsibilities are organized under the responsibility of different agencies and authorities. And that may sound complicated, and in a way it is. But on the other hand, and that's the big attraction, I think, of the Netherlands, is that we know the art of co cooperating. We know each other, we know where to find each other, and we find it uh, self-evident to uh, to cooperate so the cooperative approach that 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 is really typical for the netherlands and we all find very uh, very natural and and seldom talk about is compared to to what you may see in other countries a, a real big uh, a, a big virtue but you have to learn to get to know it Okay, that's, that's a good answer, good advice as well, yeah, which is difficult in these pandemic times to have close interactions with people. I also got a question here, again, probably a follow-up for you, Ines, and then I'll get to you, uh, you. We see some great examples of biotech successes in the Nordics, especially related to governmental support of innovation. What can Dutch biotech learn from Sweden or Denmark? That's a difficult one, but maybe Ines, you mentioned already that you have a lot of support from the government as well. Uh, what do you think would be further improved? Uh, and uh, how is your company thriving on in Dutch? Well, in, in the end, it's obviously always, I think in the Netherlands, there are quite some opportunities to, to get funding. Um, but obviously also for, for, for other countries, sometimes you want to have money to test things, eh? to test new targets, to, to, you know, to do some more innovation. And the difficulty is always, First, you need a certain proof before you get the money. And that I think that is an issue in the Netherlands, but also in other countries. So I don't think there is that much difference between obtaining or getting grants or government money in the Netherlands compared to uh, Scandinavian countries. Okay, fair point. A lot of questions comes in. A lot of questions coming in. That's good. As an East, like your company, Ines, are very important to the Dutch LSH ecosystem, but should we also try to attract the large players? Now, Amgen is one of those large players which established quite a strong presence in Holland uh, quite a few years ago already. You, can you tell us a little bit more about your reasoning in those days? You were not in the company in those days, but a little bit about the background of Amgen. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it's the, the main reason was a, a combination of a few factors. First of all, uh, like was said by previous uh, speakers, is uh, 
uh, also the, the 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 close network, uh, the logistical uh, uh, position of the Netherlands. It's uh, pretty close to main harbor ports, uh, Antwerp and Rotterdam, but also to some main airports where we, uh, you know, because we have a big logistical uh, site in, in Breda, uh, working 1,100 people in there, uh, uh, distributing the drugs from, uh, from Amgen all across the world, except from the US, where we do it from the US itself. Um, and, and one of the main reasons was logistics, close, uh, good people, talent, which is still available, um, and also the, the atmosphere, which uh, a lot of Americans feel at home here. They like to live in the Netherlands because it's open society. Everybody speaks English uh, and it's, it's really a, a good place to stay. And to okay, live. you and a little bit about, about the topic of clinical development and building yes. a company. Eh? So you're running many trials also in the yes. Netherlands. Yes. Can you say something more about the difference between clinical developments uh, Capabilities in the Netherlands versus other countries, or Europe versus. No, it's no, yeah, it's it's uh, that's actually I I I always say I have two hats. Within the Netherlands, I have my engine hat on, and I want to people to participate in engine trial. But if I go to my headquarters, I have to fight with other countries, and I have to position myself as an attractive country to do clinical research. Mm -hmm. And I'm always successful in achieving that, and, and for a few reasons. Uh, first of all. It's a small country and tight network, like Bertel's always saying, Hugo and also Ines. I mean, it's, and Ono was saying the same thing. I mean, it's it's all very close network. You will find each other and you see more and more, and that's what I stimulate and what I wanted to stimulate a few years ago when I was participating also in a working group to stimulate the R&D climate in the Netherlands, is you see much more collaboration. Uh, I mean, if you look, for instance, for uh, oncology uh, diseases in children, there's just one site in the lens where you have a concentration of all the expertise, all the knowledge, and all the patients will be there. Uh, but also early oncology. I mean, we have a very, very good network, two main oncology sites working together with Utrecht. So they have three main academic centers involved, and they, they were able to put Amgen in the phase one trials, we are the biggest contributor to phase one trials except for the US. Really? And that was okay. because we were positioning ourselves as, you know, we, this is a place to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, what they like very much, and that's a compliment to uh, both Hugo and, and, and Bert, I think, is the close collaboration and the, the ability to have a good discussion with regulatory authorities. Certainly okay. in these early phases where you have sometimes very complex trials and you're able to discuss this uh, very early on with uh, with regulatory authorities in a very open manner. And I think that is also unique from the Netherlands compared to some of the other European countries, because we are open to innovation. And that's in general for regulatory, but also for different uh, academic centers as well. They're okay. really open to, to try new things. Thanks, uh, Joop. Uh, and Hugo, indeed, what uh, Joop was saying, uh, the accessibility of companies who can talk to the regulators and the same question will come to you as well, Bert. Uh, I mean, would you say that clinical development and regulatory innovation and getting access to regulators, is that more amazing in the Netherlands or more amazing? As you said before, it's difficult. You said it's not easy. You have to know each other. How would you classify it? Amazing or amaze? No, well. If, if that's the choice, it would definitely be amazing. But but but, but indeed, let, let's not tell uh, tell each other to two uh, glorified stories. But you you have to find your way. Let's be honest. But uh, there are uh, regulatory instruments like scientific advice in 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 several stages, um, which can be done jointly between authorities um, like like ours. For, for the marketing authorization, but also the authority for clinical trials. And even at the end of the, of, of, of the chain, we also cooperate in, in collaborative advice and, uh, and, and other aspects with the government body responsible for the advices for reimbursement, because there Europe is again, quite different from the, from the US. We have health insurance systems that cover the entire population, and especially in the Netherlands. So everyone is entitled to full uh, reimbursement of all the medicines that have been admitted to the system. It, it causes some regulatory burden to get through. But once you have the advices, everything's set. And that, that's a big difference. 
and, and a big attraction for Europe, I think. Yeah. And you know, everybody look at gene therapy trials, for example, I think in the pandemic, we went from a fairly lengthy assessment period for approval of clinical trials to now a target period of 28 days and a maximum of 56 days. So I think we also are flexible. Would you agree with that statement? Of course, I'm asking for the uh, right answer. <laughs> Yes, I think I agree, um, but uh, but but let's not forget that that it it, it remained being difficult difficult procedures. Um, uh, but 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 yes, we are flexible. Okay, and Bert, to 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 stay on this topic eh, of of the environment in the Netherlands, uh, you also work a lot with academia in public and private partnerships, and many drugs, many new medicines come from academia originally. What can you say about the Netherlands in terms of academic soil, academic uh, pipeline, so to say? Yeah. Yeah, so I think this, this is a very important uh, angle because uh, it's, it's uh, uh, if you look at, at the top scientists in, in pharmacology, clinical pharmacology, but also in specific clinical fields, uh, you've already mentioned uh, the oncology, uh, cardiovascular diseases, but not to forget uh, the, the rare diseases, the orphan diseases. That's, that's a very important uh, ecosystem where there is close interactions between academia, patient groups, as already mentioned by Ines, but, but also uh, have that dialogue with, with regulators. And, and we all know that, that it is difficult to, to develop um, um, medicines for, for rare diseases. So that the early dialogue on study design, on, on endpoints, on how to conduct a trial. And that, that conversation, uh, we, we recently had a, 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 a regulatory science network where the MIB and also together with academia and industry works together. We had a workshop with, uh, with uh, EMA colleagues uh, and, and we really discussed the, the, you know, the, the top edge issues here. And, and that's something uh, where we, of course, there was not always agreement, but there is respect and there is an open mind to, to learn from each other. And that, that learning is, is key also for, for, for academia. There, there are some struggles uh, in terms of that, you know, doctors want to, they have a patient, they have a molecule, want to spring together. Um, but more and more we see the public-private uh, partnerships, there are groups like literature, but there are other groups that really want to stimulate that environment. Uh, Ines, uh, you worked with, uh or you work with uh, with Treeway as CEO, but you also have been very much involved in clinical development in another role we had in the past. What advice would you give to companies who see some academic, beautiful fruits in the Netherlands and then who want to develop those fruits into real drugs and clinical development thereafter as well? What advice would you give companies when they see something which can be developed into a drug for patients? Well, in the end, I think it, it in the end, it, a compound coming from academia is, is should be treated the same as a compound coming from the industry. Eh? So before you go to the clinic, there are a lot of steps to take. But I think in general, what has been said as well, I mean, obviously, there needs to be a license agreement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I don't think you want me to discuss that in detail at this moment. But in the end, coming back maybe to, to about the regulatory authority um, about drugs, I think what, what is really nice in Europe and also in the Netherlands is that we have a distinction between the EMA and also the national authorities because sometimes there is a very special thing, for example, uh, PKPD or sp uh, another route of administration where you can go to, or cell therapy, you can go to a certain national authority to go in depth into questions you may have. And I think that is, that is very fruitful before, for example, you go to the EMA and then at the EMA there are also Different, different timelines where you want to go. For example, I'm also working now on a, an Alzheimer project where we want to, to find new biomarkers and we go to the EMA to discuss with, an, with the innovation task force about uh, you know, the composite of endpits to be used in the clinical trials because in the end, in many clinical trials, uh, finding an effect is, is difficult and I think biomarkers are key in drug development and I think both the EMA but also national authorities in the Netherlands and in Europe are, are very willing to, to support in that. Okay, great, great. Now, um, you, uh, I have a statement here on paper which says the Netherlands have all the ingredients to become a biotech hub in Europe. 
What would you say about that? Uh, why not, maybe? Yeah, be, be open about it. What, what do you think is strong about the Netherlands and what not? No, I, I think we have all the ingredients, um, but but are we uh, there yet? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think there's always room for improvement, and that's what I want to stimulate also within the Netherlands, with academia, with other parties, with uh, uh, with regulators. There's always ways where we can improve, and and you mentioned already the example of approval mm -hmm. of uh, ATMPs. Uh, on the Dutch market, uh, we were really, we were the first one to come with an ATMP to the market and analysis to do a phase one trial. It took us one and a half year to get an approval. So I'm very happy and we struggled and we fought for it. And finally, we now come to, like you said, an approval time of, of 28 to 56 days. I mean, that's a great achievement. Uh, and that's, that's how we need to improve more and more and more. And I think one of the big ingredients where I'm now still working on very hard is how can we really go to a system where we have an outcome-based healthcare system where you know everything is measured by outcomes and, and, and having the data available to do and to build such a system, we need a very, very big improvement in our data infrastructure. Data. Everything is available. Everything is available in the Netherlands and data systems. That's not a problem. Digitalization is very high. But to connect all the dots and to bring it all together, that's, uh, that's, that's where we are working. And we're making progress. You see that all parties feel the same thing. They all want this. Great advice to, uh, to the Dutch ecosystem. You Thank you for that. I'd like to uh, give you all a final, let's say, 20 to 30 seconds max to pronounce your most, let's say, important advice to all the people who are listening right now who are considering, should I set up a shop in the Netherlands or somewhere in Europe? What advice would you give them uh, when they are considering to move from either the United States or from France or even Holland? What advice would you have for people who are responsible for scaling their biotech or their pharma company? Bert, can I ask you as the first one, uh, one single advice in 20 or 30 seconds, what would it be? Well, jo join the existing networks and, and, and regulatory innovation and, and also uh, take advantage because they have close contact with both EMA and FDA and, and the rest of the world. That is less than 20 seconds are very clear. Thank you very much. Hugo, what would be your advice to anyone listening considering this? Yeah, I would like to recommend to take a close look at how the European regulatory system is built up. We now have the European Medicines Agency in, Nadal, in, in the Netherlands, but in fact, it, it, is, a, it is a very interesting network uh, connecting thousands of, uh, of experts from all of the countries of the European Union. And the Netherlands is not exactly a small player there. Compared to our size, it's really impressive what, we're, what we bring in there. And I think it's, it's respected widely in the network. It's an interesting system. Um, so, well, please take a look at it. Thanks, uh, Hugo. Ines, what's your advice to uh, peers of yours who are not yet in the Netherlands who want to build something? I think drug development is always about having a good team with different expertise. And I think what Ono also said, I think we have a lot of talent here in the Netherlands as well. And then joining with the other stakeholders will, will bring success, I would say. Sounds good to me. Joop, you are the, uh, the final one to give some recommendations to people on uh, building and scaling their biotech, their pharma company. Um, yeah, my advice would be actually in line with the previous advice, join the network. I think that's really important. And, and as a former member, board member of the Holland Bio, I would recommend to become a member of Holland Bio because that will certainly the startup companies will have a good forum, a good platform to really get the expertise, to get help, to get the network, and to get uh, access to, uh, to talent and to recommendations in, in, in the Dutch environment. Great uh, initiative and great uh, advice. And by the way, we are running this show on the platform of Massachusetts Bio. So in that respect, we are uh, already collaborating with Mars. As well. Thanks a lot, uh, distinguished panel members. Great contribution. Thank you very much indeed. I'd like to hand over for some wrapping up remarks to our ambassador again, Clemos Rosvendor. Clemos. Thank you. Thank you all. Yes, well, what comes to my mind is, is to shout, get connected with us, with everybody who is so enthusiastic about what it, what it delivers. Because 
of course, it's not by accident. That struck me when I was, when I was thinking. We have had big results as the Netherlands in, in our history in how to deal with that we don't drown by uh, water. Huh? I mean, we have our Delta Werke, our, our big, big uh, uh, things that we, we achieved to do to, to stay a country uh, and, and be productive and be a good community together. So we have a history in that, also agriculture. So it's not by accident that we do this. And I think it is um, uh, very important that all the speakers say that, well, let's say, oh no, what he was saying, if you want to write a top selling boys book, you can write the first chapters here. But I hear that everybody says, if you have written your first part of the book, you can also come here because we all want to write the, the next volumes. And I think that is what we are doing. We're innovating together. That's what I hear. We have a very good ecosystem with all the talent that we need. And we have a drive to improve. It is not like that we say, well, we're here. Great, join us. And uh, that's okay. No, 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 we have challenges to face. And I think there is no better point in time of history for, for us living now than, than joining together and not being nationalistic, but see that we have to do things together in Europe with each other and that uh, EMA really is going to be of big help. And like Hugo also said, it's, it's, it's a challenge to see how can we th get things arranged in Europe. So I think it's very, very important that we have one, a very good ecosystem, everything in place, but that we're not lazy. And that we ask you and invite you to get connected to do the thing with us together, and that we will provide you with very interesting discussions. You know the Netherlands, I mean, ah, but also with results. So um, I want to be an ambassador of you all. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting very much inspired by this uh, all together. So join the network, I'd say, and, and be with us. Thanks for those uh, concluding remarks, Clemence. This brings me to the end of this webinar. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for asking your questions. And by the way, all the questions which have not been answered in the webinar will be answered separately by people in our backstage room. So you'll get those possibilities. You also get information about whom you can contact. So all of all, there will be follow up here. Thank you very much again. The Netherlands wants to be a biotech hub in Europe. We have all the ingredients to become the Boston by the North Sea, as we often refer to. Uh, we really want to help everybody to be a part of that, part of this community. Thank you very much again. Thanks to our speakers and have a great evening. Have a great day. Bye-bye.